So our final talk this morning is on the human person as sacrament. And as I was reviewing uh, my notes, uh, you know, the one thing that came to mind is that the Franciscan tradition really is a tradition of Christian humanism. It, it is really about the human person as person. Uh, and I want to explore that today with you, especially uh, in light of our culture today, in which we have lost a sense of personhood. We know the story of Francis and his early conversion period. We know that as a young man, Francis had a great disdain of lepers. Uh, we know that when he would see a leper from a distance, he would, he would kind of go, oh, you know, oh my God, you know, and hold his nose and gallop away. He just was repulsed by the sight of lepers. But after that, you know, that encounter, uh, his, his own turning, you know, praying in the San Damiano Chapel, the experience of God in his life, uh, the biographers tell us that he's riding his horse one day, and, you know, in his path comes a leper. Instead of galloping away, something within him causes him to stop, get off his horse, and go and meet that leper. And he kisses the leper's hand, and he gives the leper alms, and uh, the story goes on that Francis again mounted his horse and then went away, but turned back to see the leper again. And when he turned back, no leper was in sight. So some scholars have said, you know, the story is probably real, but it also is telling us something about Francis. There were things within him, you know, lepers within his own life, you might say, that he had to confront, and he had to come to reconciliation with. At the end of his own life, in his testament, Francis recounts that experience by saying, what was bitter tasted sweet. In that kiss of the leper's hand, he met something of God, the goodness of God. And from that point on, he made it a point to live with the lepers and to consider them his brothers. What we find uh, from Francis is that he realizes that humanity is good and it is loved, but we are loved by God because we bear the divine image of God within us. So in his own admonition five, uh, Francis writes, he says, consider in what great excellence the Lord God has placed you, for he has created you and formed you to the image of his beloved son, according to the body, and to his likeness, according to the spirit. Now, interesting that he focuses on the, not just the spirit. It's not just something abstract about us that's like God. We are like God physically. That's what he's saying here, in the body and the spirit. And we sort of, we, we kind of gloss over the body part at times because we think it can't be true. But that is what incarnation is about. So he says, at another point, he says, the Lord God gives each of us our whole body, our whole soul, and our whole life. Of course, we know that Francis is writing at the time of the Cathars, right? And Catharism was a dualism. Cat, the Cathars believed there's no way, you know, this omnipotent God could get involved with messy, fragile, weak humanity. You know, so the Cathars or the dualists had this idea that, you know, God was born, one of, the, one of the ways they had things was God was born from the side of Mary's ear because she heard the word. <laughs> now, I know it seems, <laughs> they, you know, I always say this, good heresies never die. They, they just are... <laughs> They just are reborn and repackaged in different ways. So, um, you know, so the emphasis on the body is, is Francis's way and a Christian way of saying that we believe that God became flesh and that God lives in flesh, fleshly human persons. Uh, so we can speak of the sacramentality of the human person. So I broke the word here, sacramentality. 
So to, to realize that it's sacramentality really means a consciousness of the sacred. You know, so that when we don't treat one another like, you know, brute objects, but there's a consciousness that, even if I don't agree with you, that God lives in you. So it's this consciousness of the sacred realizing that the outward expression of what we are uh, reflects what fills us inwardly. And, you know, Francis Sinclair both had this idea of outward inwardness. What we express outward, if we live truthfully, should be reflective of what fills us inwardly. Uh, untruth is where the inward stuff is not being really expressed outward, that we're living sort of two, two, two different phases. So the human person as sacrament mediates and is a mediating symbol of God's presence. In this, pre in this person, God is alive in this way. Um, so what makes us into this image of God? And I, truthfully, I think we have so domesticated this idea of image of God. Yeah, we're an image of God. I mean, think about that for a moment. Do you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, good morning, image of God, you know? <laughs> do, you, do you think of yourself, you know, when you're having a bad day? You know, like, I really can't stand that person. Oh, by the way, I'm an image of God, you know. <laughs> we don't. We don't have a consciousness of being image of God. But yet, that is what we are told. That scripture tells us we are created in the image of God. Francis reminds us what shapes us into this image. Well, on the Franciscan side of things, it's really love and freedom in love. In other words, how we love and the choices we make to love in our lives. Uh, so love shapes us into, because God is love. And the way we love reflects the way we are godly or godlike. So through opening oneself up to God's generous love, we find our identity as human. Um, and of course, the, the true image for us, the image of images, is Jesus Christ. I mean, that's really what Francis Sinclair would show us, that, you know, we are to gaze upon that mirror of the cross, because that mirror of the cross is a reflection of what we are and who we are as image of God. Christ is the true image, and we are created in that image. So everything that Christ is about, we are to be about as well. Now, there are four main points I'd like to go through this morning with you uh, as, I, as I see them within uh, Franciscan spirituality and speaks to the dignity of human personhood. One is dignity itself, and then relationship, dialogue, and prayer. So let's, let's begin with these. First of all, just to reiterate, we're about incarnation. We're about word made flesh. We're about God is among us, you know, just, just to, so Francis was always, you can't, you can never like just sort of take that for granted, you know, just like, well, yeah, we're Christian, so God is among us, yeah, and you're what, you're Muslim, okay, so, fine, so, you know, but Francis was like, wow, you know, God has become one of us, God is bending low in love to be with us, so he you know, one of the brothers hears him pray in the garden at one point. Who are you, O Lord, and who am I? Who am I that I could even know you and love you? Did you ever stop and think, how is it that we can even love God? I mean, that's an amazing, amazing capacity that we have. So he was always awestruck, and we should always be in awe of the great mystery of God in our lives. Um, so for him, it's, it's about personhood. Jesus Christ is a person. And the word person cannot be overemphasized here. Um, and I'll come back to this, but let me just say for here, to be a person is to be a relational being. That's what it means to be person. It means that there's a sounding through in our lives. 
that we are in relationship. So we speak of the divine persons of the Trinity. We don't speak of the Trinity as three individuals. We speak of the Trinity as three persons because they are relational um, persons. And that personhood means sharing uh, the experience of God's love in the flesh, sharing the experience of Christ. And therefore, it's a reciprocity. To be a person in relationship mean, means that there's relationality and mutuality. Those two things go together. Uh, and therefore, it's about the experience of God in the in-between. That's what we're about. Not just, oh, God is in me, is in God is in you. It's rather the God in me now reaches out and re recognizes the God in you. And when we unite, God becomes alive in us. So the, the gospel saying, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And we're talking here about relationality. <clears throat> so the primary focus, as we said yesterday, it's not work. I mean, the works of mercy are great, but that's not, what the, that's not the goal here. Nor is it prayer. Prayer is essential, but it's not the goal. The goal is the human person. The human person, the one we actually take for granted. You know, we, we, be, we begin with the human person. For Franciscan spirituality, it's the goal of what our life is about. So I want to just spend a little bit of time here on personhood. Because as I said yesterday, we do tend to treat one another today, <clears throat> and especially the culture at large, as data points. You know, we're sort of anonymous numbers in the system. So life, you know, today our culture runs on systems, and we, we humans are sort of data in the systems. So we have lost sight of the human person as person, you know, and we feel that we can do whatever we want to persons. Uh, one of the things that SCOTUS, now here's where Franciscans actually distinguish themselves from Thomas. St. Thomas believed in the analogy of being. So, you know, God is being, and God creates us, and we're, we're sort of, we participate in God's being. So what, what Thomas would say is that we can never really know God. So things are like God, but we can never really, you know, sort of really get, you know, um, a true union there with God. Um, Scotus believed in uh, univocal being. It's just being. God's being, our being, but God is infinite being, eternal being, and we're finite created. Anyway, Scotus said God creates us in a way that God is uniquely present to everything God creates by the nature of his understanding. So God, Scotus calls our attention to the thisness of each thing. Because God creates each, each person, each aspect of creation is uniquely um, God created. He's, he says that the very being of something which makes it itself is really unique to that being. In other words, it's not like a grain of sand can be substituted for another grain of sand. It's rather this grain of sand is uniquely created by God. And he, said, he calls this, this idea of thisness or hectetas, and it relates to the individuation of anything that exists. Not individualism, but individuation. So hectetas points to the ineffable beingness of everything that exists. Every star, every atom, every bacteria. I know, and people say, does, does this apply to snakes and scorpions and things like this? And I'm like, well, yes, if we follow this through. Everything has a unique beingness to it. So each being within the created order has a unique dignity to it. It's already gifted by this loving creator with a holiness beyond our ability to understand. Now just stay with that for a moment. And just think of how we treat people and nature on a daily basis. You know, it's sort of all lump summed. We take nature for granted. I mean, I know this week we took our power for granted. 
We take, you know, water for granted, the sun, uh, air, the clouds. It's all sort of like supposed to be there for us. But what SCOTUS is saying that everything is uniquely created and bears with it, you might say, a unique relationship with God. So Hecetas points to the individuality at the core of each being. Everything that exists. I mean, look at the beauty of this flower. You know, look at the details of, of the, of the um, petals. You know, look at the inner core of it, the colors. So Hecetas points to the positive dimension of being, which makes it a this and not that, which means that we cannot substitute one thing for another too easily. It's not that, well, so we have this flower here. We'll just chop it off, cut it down. We'll just put in another flower, you know. Um, or, you know, you have a person at, who does a job, and you say, oh, well, you know, so what? So we'll get another person to do that job. You see, in the analogy being, there's sort of like, there's a likeness. So, you know, we can substitute one thing for another. It doesn't make any real difference. In SCOTUS's world, you can't really substitute anything for anything else because no two beings are alike. Everything that exists bears a unique, unclonable thisness, and it's irrepeatable for all eternity, even with modern genetics. So what SCOTUS will say is that peace and nature intertwine. That's a little bit different from Thomas's idea that grace uh, builds on nature. Here we're saying everything that exists is graced nature. Its very beingness, its very createdness is graced nature. Now here's what he also adds. Nothing in creation is accidental. Nothing is excessive. Nothing is worthless or trivial. Now, there is a scale of values, you know, along the way. But what he's saying is that everything that exists, there's some unique uh, beingness of God or, um, and therefore has a unique role in creation. Uh, this even goes, you know, people have often asked about bacteria and, you know, lower, lower non-human types of things. Well, couldn't we do without them? And what biologists will tell us, if you look at the broader scheme of life, even those things we don't like play a role. They have their own role to play in life. So what we're saying is that each and everything, no matter how small or how insignificant, is of infinite value because it images God in its own unique being. Now, we could probably just stay here and, and, and just take the rest of the day to, to sit with this as we begin to go about our daily lives, you know, encountering one another, you know, walking out in the hallway here, looking at the flowers, and to think that each thing in its own way, is expressing God in some way. Thomas Merton wrote in his New Seeds of Contemplation, he said, the pale flowers are the dogwood outside this window are saints. The little yellow flowers that nobody notices on the edge of that road are saints looking up into the face of God. This leaf has its own texture and its own pattern of veins and its own holy shape, and the bass and the trout hiding in the deep pools of the river are canonized by their beauty and their strength. That is not just simply the eye of the poet. That is the, the pen of a mystic, the one who is seeing nature for more than mere physicality the depth, the radiant beauty of everything that exists. So things are godlike in their specificity. And regular attention to the wider world of nature is fundamental. We come back to contemplation. It's a penetrating vision that gets to the truth of reality. Vision, as I was saying yesterday, is so fundamental here. If we go back to the Gospels, 
and see how many times Jesus talks about vision. You know, the Jews say, we see, you know, we see what's going on. He said, it's because you say you see, blindness remains. We see, but we don't see. We hear, but we don't hear. Our senses have become somewhat deadened. And in our own culture, they become more deadened by overloading them with things, consumerisms, and all types of isms in our own day have deadened our eyes and our ears to see and to hear this mystery of godlike specificity in everything that exists. So the, the, the Jesuit poet, Gerard Manley Hopkins, and you probably are familiar with this, but you know, he was very taken by Scotus's notion of inscape, that there is a depth within everything that exists, and that depth is that unique, godlike, you know, presence. And he wrote this poem, As Kingfishers Catch Fire. He says, as kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame, deals out that being indoors each one dwells, selves goes itself. Myself, it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is me, for that I came. I say more, the just man justices, keeps graces, that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father, through the features of men and women's faces. And I think that's what Francis was about. He really became attentive to the brothers, not in some sort of group, you know, as brothers, but each brother in his um, unique creation. Uh, and that's how he began to live as a human person. You know, again, as I mentioned yesterday, you know, the brother who suffered from depression, he welcomed him. He listened to him. He stayed with him. Uh, the brother who was tempted, who had a lot of scruples about, you know, his life. And Francis said, don't worry about it. You know, he listened to him. He spent time. This type of attentiveness takes time. And we, in our culture, do not have time for one another. We don't have time for the things of creation. But Francis had time to be with the men who came to him. And he listened, and he was attentive to their needs, their worries, their, their, their darkness. And, of course, you know, the, the, the famous story of the hungry brother. You know, it's, you know, they're all sitting, at, they're all, you know, sleeping in this large dormitory. And one night they hear this cry of a brother, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Now, Francis doesn't say, who did that? You know, who said that? You know, because, you know what? You can't cut this life. You're out of here, you know. He doesn't follow a law. Francis always follows the spirit. And the spirit, oh, he, he gets up and he says, who is our hungry brother? And he wakes all the brothers up. Now imagine you're working 12 hours that day. You're exhausted. You know, you finally get to bed. And now you're getting woken up at 2 in the morning because one of your brothers is hungry. What's your first reaction going to be? I'm going to kill that guy, you know? <laughs> But what Francis says is our brother is hungry and we must be attentive to his needs because that's what relationality is about. That brother is part of the whole and each brother is part of that hungry brother. And so they all eat together. Now, I say this because we have come to a place in our culture where, where we have almost disposable people, you know, the poor. Uh, those, those who are marginalized in our, in our culture today. Those who feel they are unwanted, unloved, 
Uh, there's no one there. They don't count for anything. And uh, in my book, Compassion, I um, repeat a poem by Graziano Marchese, who works here in the Archdiocese of Chicago. And if you don't mind, I'd like to read it to you, because I think Graziano really captures what is the dilemma of our age with regard to personhood and what that dilemma is in terms of us as Christian Eucharistic people. The poem is called Tabernacles. And I love the title because it speaks to us of Eucharist. He writes, it happened fast. A feeble-brained innocent, refugee from halfway spaces, moving at the wrong time. The bread raised high, the cup engaged in mystery, and he chooses this time to change his seat from one church side to the other. For a moment, his head blocks the view of bread yielding to miracle. For a moment, his face and the bread are one. The words spoken over both, then hands shake, extending proper peace, cheeks meet. Words wish a peace the world has never tasted. He stares like a dog, offered too many bones at once, and accepts only one hand's greeting. Next comes procession to his first meal of the day, as faces clearly wonder if he understands what this is all about. He takes the proffered piece of pita in this most post-Vatican assembly and stops. Momentarily thrown by this bread with pockets, he's oh so gently reassured that it's quite all right to eat. He takes, and green teeth masticate the body of Christ. Then he reaches for the syrup goodness of the cup. Just three sips after him, I debate the wisdom of changing lines. His pup cheek mouthful nearly drains the cup. I almost wish he had, so I wouldn't need to tell myself I won't catch some disease. And then, I knew it, he coughs and sends forth a rosy mist that sprays divinity onto the floor. A rainbow comes and goes in that unexpected spray as gasps are quelled in 40 throats. He clamps his mouth with leaky hands, looking like a child, trying to keep a pricked balloon from bursting. Unslackened, the line moves on, and divinity is trampled by shod feet, still pure white linen, bleached and starched, in fervent hands that won't permit impiety. Drinks the pink god from the floor. In a corner, he sits alone in rapt humiliation. When someone asks, are you okay? He quickly shows his palms and says, I didn't wipe them on my dirty pants. I didn't. I rubbed them hard together, see? And he demonstrates with insect frenzy how he used friction to evaporate the spilled God from his hands. Oh, what a cunning God who tests our faith by hiding in green teeth tabernacles to see how truly we believe in the miracle of real presence. Isn't that To me, this poem really captures a lot of our own lives today. You know, we can go to church, we can participate in the sacraments, but then when we become challenged by someone who we might deem lesser than us, not one of us, you know, an outsider, we do everything we can to build the barriers around us so that we don't catch a disease, we don't have to touch them. Evangelical life is a relational life. And as we said yesterday and again today, it is all about relationship. How we are making Christ alive and recognizing the God who is among us and one of us. Francis did this in his own way, and he came to see and to live within the reality of gift. Do we recognize each other as gift, as 
this gift, at this moment, this person. You know, do you ever talk to someone and they're, they're you know, they're looking at you preoccupied. Uh, and, you know, you're talking to them, but you're not sure if they're really hearing you because their minds seem to be somewhere else. And we're missing the moment of the gift that this is God present here in this person. Francis saw the structure and the reality and all, not just people and the poor, but creation itself to be gift. And he said in his earlier rule, he says, let us refer all good to the Most High and Supreme Lord God and acknowledge that every good is his and thank him for everything from whom all good things come. It's God's goodness that makes the goodness of this person possible. It's God's goodness that makes the goodness of this tree and this flower and this day possible. So we are called to be with people, among people, because that's where God lives. And in that amongness and withinness, to bear witness to Christ, to Christian life. But that means for Francis not to engage in quarrels or disputes. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road, especially in our, in our age. Francis's way is to be subject. As I said yesterday, to be subject, to be thrown under. In other words, to be with. And that means to listen, to talk together respectfully, to see into the eyes of another that this is God here. This is God's gift of life in front of me. We may not agree, but that's okay. It's okay to have differences. What we are to do is to discover the presence of God in every person. And here's what I, I find sometimes today is our, our inability to accept difference, our inability to engage in dialogue. We don't engage in dialogue anymore. We react. What we, can, what we fail to realize is that God is the God of diversity. It's God who has made us diverse. We haven't made ourselves diverse. God loves diversity, and maybe even God loves to have a difference of opinion. And therefore, what Francis calls us to is to be a sign and symbol of the grace-filled richness of God present in human life. Our call, if we want to be countercultural, is not to give in to the culture's polarization and fear of opposition. We are to be mirrors of the reign of God, that Christ is our life, that what we are about is in unity and love. So as we said yesterday, Francis wasn't afraid to risk. People did not all agree with Francis. Many people, just like Jesus of Nazareth, they didn't understand his life. You know, you can imagine, well, we know his own family didn't get it, but his relatives, his friends, you know, it didn't stop him from going out and meeting people, you know, to try to be there with them as God's love, giving birth to Christ in a new way. So to do this, just to, you know, recount a little bit from yesterday, we need, I think, three key factors. One, again, as I, as I um, like to emphasize, that poverty or the sine proprio of the not possessing. So you can have your opinions, you can have your political ideas, you can have your whatever it is. That's fine. Just don't possess them, because when we possess them, when we grasp onto them, we cling to them, we make them ours, we set ourselves up over and against the next person. And so the way to engage in dialogue and relationship is to live sine proprio, without possessing. Allow a space within your heart to accept the other even the other who is different from you. And in that acceptance, to begin to feel 
you know, try to see maybe why is that person, what, you know, where are you coming from? What is it in your life? Come to know another person before judging another person. I like this admonition of Francis because I, I do think it speaks to um, this idea of relationality with poverty as its core. In admonition 16, 14, rather, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. There are many who, applying themselves insistently to prayers and good deeds, engage in much abstinence and many mortifications of their bodies, but they are scandalized and quickly roused to anger by a single word which seems injurious to their person or by some other things which might be taken away from them. These persons are not poor in spirit, and therefore the kingdom of heaven is not theirs. You know, so what Francis asks us to be is authentic persons. So what we are called to do first is to receive. We are called to be poor, to have that space within us, to receive that gift of God that comes to us in another. Give thanks. Give thanks even for those who are different from you. Francis was very keen on love of enemies. If you read his earlier rule, chapter 22, the first paragraph, but in that receptivity of other, in that giving thanks for the gift of God in the other, we bear witness to the word of God, that this word continues to, to bear witness in our life to that immense love of God. And that means to respect the difference in diversity. Even if we never come, you know, there, I have been in situations where we have been in unresolved in other words, uh, my, my way of seeing things or interpreting them was not seen by the other person. And that's okay. We left it at that. But I can still respect that person because that person is trying the best he or she is to live their Christian life and their life in this world. Be open to the truth of the other. In other words, that in that person, God is there and God is shining through. In their fragile humanity, what I find today is that we have lost patience with fragile humanity. Fragile humanity. Every person has limits. We are fragile human beings. We are not bulwarks, you know, that can be bulldozed over. We do fail, every one of us. We do sin, every one of us. But I think each person tries to love and wants to love in some way and to be loved. So Francis struggled in his own life, you know, to remain with his experience of gift. You know, there were many times I think he could have, you know, just said, boy, I'm running out to the mountains. I am not coming back because these guys are nuts. You know, but he, he constantly strove that living sine proprio always recognizing that God, everything begins with God, and everything finds its fullness in God. And therefore, he doesn't want to tell the world what it isn't. You know, you're sinful, you're weak, you're going down the wrong path, you know, you're a mess. But he tells it what it truly is, God's gift. I think for young people today, this is what they need to hear, and they need to hear it loudly that each person is a gift. Your life, your unique thisness. You know, where young people say, oh, I'm not smart enough, or I'm not talented enough. I can't do sports. I can't play an instrument. I'm a nobody. Nobody wants to talk to me. And why? Because the culture has made the whole thing into idolatry. And what we must do is to reclaim that every person is an icon uniquely written by God, that in your unique giftedness, God is shining through. So Francis says, again, let us refer all good to that most high and supreme God and acknowledge that every good is his and thank him for everything, everything, even the things that are not so good in our lives, because those times can be learning moments for us. 
they can be the beginning of a new way of seeing things. Everything comes from the goodness of God. Again, blessed is the one who attributes every good to God, for he who holds back something for himself hides within himself the money of his Lord God, and that which he thought he had shall be taken away from him. We do not, we, again, as I said yesterday, we are not the masters. We are not the ones in control here. We do not put the limits on what God can and cannot do, on who God loves and de does not love. Sin is living in the exile of unrelatedness. It's the refusal to get your feet dirty. It's the refusal to get involved in the messiness of life. You know, and I find today, I find us exhausted, and I find us so kind of depleted of energy. It's like, ah, oh, let them, you know, let them fight it out. I'm not getting involved. You know, let them. But what we are called is not so much to get involved just to get involved. We are called to be peacemakers, reconcilers, builders of love. And, and what happens with sin, when we cut ourselves off, we become enclosed in ourselves. We become all about us. You know, it's all about me. So sin is my, you know, a will to power. You know, I'm just going to do my little thing. I'm going to live my little life. Let them do whatever they want. Now, we do this within families. We do it within community life. We do it within the church. And, and when we do that, when we cut ourselves off, we have factions. We have divisions. We have fragmentation. And that, in my view, is opposed to Christ. So sin is experienced as a closedness and inability to love. It's a failure to realize what we are capable of. And it's the resistance to expansion through union with others. In a world that is marked today by difference, globalization, migration, the boundaries of ethnicity and culture and religion are changing and in some places just dissolving. And we're becoming a new humankind, a new global community. We must learn anew how to love and to accept one another. Now, here's the thing, as I said yesterday. Evangelical life, our relational life, is not an I-it life. <laughs> it is an I-thou life, a face-to-face -face encounter of persons, eye-to-eye. -eye. But truthfully, we find ourselves on the left-hand side today increasingly. I worked, you know, at WTU, we had a president who was a, a strong introvert. He didn't like to even deal with, you know, talk to people. So he would email everyone, you know, like, so, I mean, we'd be working right down the hall, but he would email you, you know. We don't even use the telephone anymore. You know, we text, I mean, young people just text. Telephones are antiquated. So that's in the Museum of American History now. So <clears throat> we are quickly moving. Now, some of you heard me talk about, we are quickly moving into a new form of humanity, what some call transhumanism. And the term at sometimes used is post-human. We're moving beyond the human. And you say, oh my God, that's incredible. You know, it seems like the stuff of science fiction. But think of all the technologies we have today. Um, we are really, uh, computer technology is no longer just a help for us. It has become to organize our daily lives, you know. And some people will say if they lose their cell phone, they've lost part of themselves. You know, like, I can't go on because I lost my cell phone. So the term transhumanism is the, the use of technologies to improve the human body at the individual level. Um, and that and it begins with the idea of cyborgs, everything from any mechanical device like glasses or hearing aids or a little you know, um, uh, rods in your knees, to the fact that computers are increasingly thinking for us. So artificial intelligence is that uh, approximate human reasoning by organizing and, and, and manipulating and controlling our knowledge. Everything about our world today is all web-based. I mean, it's amazing on one hand that we have created these technologies. I mean, that we could act, you know, contact people in Africa and Asia, and so that's incredible. 
It is rather not that we have created these technologies and how wonderful they are, because I do love it. It is rather our dependency on them. And here is the transhumanist motto. Technology will fulfill what religion promises. Now, you say to yourself, how is that possible? And it's so subtle. It has just crept into our culture at an alarming speed and will continue to do so unless we wake up to what we're doing with technologies. Two things. One, the, the radical transhumanists hope one day that technology will allow us to live an enduring life, or what re religiously we call eternal life. The second thing is technology, um, you know, aims to reduce, if not overcome, human suffering and death. So salvation, immortality are two fundamental Christian principles that transhumanists think that technology will be able to fulfill. Now, recent studies on robotics indicate that robots will be, are increasingly entering our community. And you think, no, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, I just, <laughs> so you don't have to worry about church membership or about your communities because pretty soon you'll be having robots there. You know, we, know, we know we have robo elder care. Now it's sad because we no longer have time to spend with our elderly parents, our elder members. You know, this is a lot of Western culture. So now we can get a robot, you know, that will be there for you, you know, that will hold your hand, maybe laugh at your jokes. Um, we have robo workers in the industrial world. That's been going on for a long time. And we also have robo pets. You know, as one, um, one news line said, robotic pet won't soil your carpet. It's a lot easier to maintain. And actually, the guy who they interviewed said, he said, I'd love to have a real pet. I just don't have time to deal with real things. So I got myself a robo pet. Now, it's just amazing. But think how fast technology is coming upon us. Uh, I mean, I got my first computer in 1991, and I, I thought I had entered an entirely new age. I was at Fordham, and one of my classmates said, my husband works for IBM, we'd like to give you a computer for your work. I had a yellow legal pad and a, a pen. And I came home with this thing called an IBM computer, and the sisters were like, wow, what do you do with this? And I said, I don't know, well, I'll, let's try, like, turn it on. So we turned it on, and we're staring at it, you know. And it took us months to figure out the Word Perfect program, you know. <clears throat> Today, my, my you know, three-year-old grandniece get, opens up the computer, and boom, 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 you know, they're typing away. And so the whole, I mean, young people look like us, but their brains are different, really. <laughs> So, <laughs> they're all texting. <laughs> but pretty soon we're going to have educational robots, you know. Don't worry about your child at school. You know, you send the robot with them, and the robot will take in all the information and help your child along. So we are in this, this era of transhumanism. And what Ray Kurzweil anticipates is that don't worry about death. We'll be able to download your brain into a chip. We'll just replant it in a new medium. You'll be good to go for another 200 years. So, it, you know, the eventual replacement of brain cells by electronic circuits. Wow, is that possible? Is this what it means to be a person? Do you see where we have come in a relatively short amount of time? We're talking within the last 50 years. Um, Sherry Turkle's book, Alone Together, is a, is, is a really interesting study. She interviewed over 200 people on the use of technology in their lives. And the subtitle is, Why We Expect More from Our Technologies Than From One Another. And that's our challenge today. We are putting more and more emphasis and time with our technologies, my cell phone, my computer, my whatever, whatever app it is that makes life worth living, you know, then from one another. And as we invest more time in our technology, we are more short with one another. We don't have time for one another. And that's our challenge. So we are called back to an I-thou relationship. And that means yielding oneself to the here and now through dialogue. 
Become the person God has created us to be as person. Share your personhood in the unplanned grace of the full living moment. Meet one another along the way. You know, put your, put your cell phone down or your computer down and see the next person eye to eye. So, you know, that's, I think, how Francis came, came into that creation-centered brotherhood because he was a person among persons. And therefore, even creation itself, you know, has something of personality to it, the bees and the trees and the flowers and the crickets. So he saw himself as part of that cosmic family, not a hierarchical, you know, not, we're not like human beings, we're on the top of the ladder and we have sort of graded levels of human beings and then creation is below us. Francis is a descending solidarity and to recognize the, the magnificent beauty and goodness of God in all creation as brother and sister. And again, like Scotus, he considers nothing excessive or accidental. Everything, no matter how insignificant, that's the key for us. No matter how insignificant, everything has infinite value because it reflects God in its own unique way. John Seed, an ecology writer today, writes, an echo theology or an echo consciousness means I no longer see myself as protecting the rainforest, but that I am part of the rainforest protecting myself. I am that part of the rainforest emerged into thinking. It's a shift in consciousness. Christianity is really a shift in consciousness. We cannot keep being Franciscan and Christian without changing the way we think about ourselves in relationship to the world around us. Here's one of, I love these little stories from Chilano, you know, Francis taking the bees and, and um, you know, making sure they're safe in winter, calling animals by, by a name. And of course, he loves um, all bees, especially the meek. Again, as we were talking yesterday, this idea of conversion, this openness of being turned, to everything, turn, 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 you know. Um, you need to keep turning and turn. Catch yourself. Are you being an individual and running into individualism? You know, because our culture is all about the ism of the individual. Be all you can be. You're number two, try harder. You know, you can be number one. It's all about you. So what we're called about is all about us. We know that Francis never spoke in the first person. He only used the word we, if you look at his writings. It's always a community of brothers and sisters. So we are to have a sounding through in our lives. What sounds through in our lives? What is it? Are we all closed, closed up in ourselves? I'm not going to change my opinion. I don't like what she has to say. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to deal with this at all. I'm just going to attend the meeting. I'm going to sit in the back, you know. Or are we going to be like, okay, the God in my life sees the God in your life. And the God in my life I allow to sound through and to recognize maybe a new idea coming from you, a new way of thinking. When do, does the neighbor or the person become part of who I am rather than an object to be dealt with or an intrusion on my otherwise private space? When Now, it's not that we don't need times for solitude. We do, and we know that Francis was constantly running off to the mountains for solitude. Solitude is key to relationality. Let me highlight that. It's not about being with people 24-7. It's about relationship with others. So we are called then to a type of releasement. Releasement is another way of talking about poverty or living sine proprio. Releasement means to let be. It's an openness to being and a letting be in which the experience of myself as reverential openness to everything uh, that is, is a freedom to let others be as well. You know, in, in other words, I'm not trying to control you. I don't want you to make you into what I think I, you know, the world should be. I let be. I let you be. So that letting be is receptivity. It's openness to, mutual, to mutuality. And as we release, we let go, we can then see differently. 
We don't have to be preoccupied with, with controlling everything. So conversion is that turning in grace to let go. Turn and let go and let others be. And therefore, when we can make space, then we welcome the interdependence of human, um, human life. Miroslav Volk, the Croatian theologian, speaks of a phenomenology of embrace. An embrace is an opening up of the arms that signifies to the other, I cannot be alone. I need you in some way. And it means I may not understand you. To embrace does not make the other into another myself. It means I embrace you as you are. And in, in that embrace, I can leave the unanswered questions, the unresolved differences between us to let them go and let them be. See, we need to move beyond these, these levels of conflict and difference to the level of personhood, what binds us together. So conversion goes hand in hand with conversation. It's like word and world, you know, world is word with love. Conversation is conversion. Um, and therefore, Francis uh, is that one who can let go, allow God's goodness to shine through, you know, recognize the gift of all, and accept himself as part of creation. It's also recognizing our own limits, to know that we are fragile. We, each one of us, has limits. Uh, just a note here on prayer. Prayer is that call to existence. We cannot do any of this unless we are persons of prayer, a deep dialogue with God, that God continues to create us um, in our beingness. Um, Barbara Freon says, the dilemma of our time is not that we do not have time to pray. Rather, our prayerlessness causes the dilemma. That's a very interesting insight. Uh, we cut ourselves off from becoming human. And she says, the age of nihilism and alienation is not because God is dead. We are dead. We are dead as human, and our call is to become alive, to become alive as a human person. That's what the incarnation's about. So Francis did not so much pray as he became living prayer, as Thomas of Chalano writes. Uh, and Francis of himself tells us, don't be so concerned about the cares of the world and temporal. Well, we are concerned. I mean, certainly when we lose our jobs and when we need money to keep a roof over our head. And, but don't make that the, the end point of everything. You know, that's the value of community. That's why it's about relationality. We do need one another. Um, our task is to keep the spirit of the Lord alive and working within us. And Francis says, wherever we go, we bring our body with us. You know, our body is our cell. We are all called to be little hermits, so to speak, by staying with God in the inner heart, wherever and wherever we go in the world. So, um, again, just to say, prayer without, action without prayer may become activism. We can become all out there, yay, 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 ecology, justice, peace, you know, fight, fight, fight. But without prayer, it can be an empty center. And I do think it's prayer that changes things, not our actions necessarily. You know, so what we want is to be as active contemplatives, to act out of a prayerful center. Um, and that means we disengage from the worldliness of the world, the world that is opposed to God, and we live out of a God-centered life to bring that God into the world. Um, I'm going to go through this because I'm looking at the time. We are called to live in a sacramental world, and what we're saying is we need a new way of thinking. We need a new way of thinking and a new way of acting. If being Franciscan and being Christian doesn't change the way you think about things, then you have to ask, what are we doing? What are we about? Because when the level of awareness changes, we do start attracting a new reality. We go, oh, now I get it, you know? And we are called, therefore, to a conversion in God through poverty, humility, conversion, compassion. Everything our culture says, are you kidding? You want, you want to become poor? 
You want to actually, like, help people? You know, you want to be humble? Hey, you've got to be number one. You have to get the best job, the best house, you know. It's got to be bigger, larger, you know, more, 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 and we're becoming less, 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 less. And what we are called to do is to change the way we think and act. We are co-creators in Christ. No, without us who are committed to Christ, Christ cannot become truly the reality in this world. And that means overcome those obstacles that prevent us from participating in God's love. The Jewish writer Eddie Hilsom, 27 years old, in a concentration camp, a young Jewess, comes to great mystical insight while she's in a concentration camp. She writes at one point, you, God, cannot help us. We must help you by creating a place for you within us. Wow. You, we are always expecting God to be doing stuff for us, but the whole point of incarnation is God is among us. And when we make room for God in our lives, we begin to help one another. And that's the way God helps us. As Vladimir Roski wrote, God is a beggar at the soul's door, not daring to force it open. We make the choice to accept God into our lives or not. If we do, that power of God's love is then the seed of a new creation. So what took place in the life of Jesus must be a part of our lives as well. And that means finding the world in its truest reality to fill the Christ form with our life, our business. Yes, you, each one of you, is Christ in a unique, particular way. You are called to live that Christ in a unique, particular way. You, with whatever your illness, your, your face, your life, your history, you are God's love at this moment. And that's why we have, each of us, a unique dignity, a dignity in our own lives and a dignity we must respect in one another. To know that this life is always a dying, why do we fear death? I don't know. Francis's way of life is a dying all along the way. As he says in the canonical of creation, Blessed are those who endure the first death, for the second death will do them no harm. It is a letting go all along the way, a release into a newness of life all along the way. So become family, become brother and sister, and respect the world of nature by discovering yourself as part and parcel of a larger whole. This is a world that is crying out. It is universally starved for love, for justice, for peace. You, brothers and sisters, and I are called to make Christ alive here and now in this moment, because the glory of God is the human person fully alive. Thank you.